Hello everybody, Flick here, it's time for yet another Let's Look At, and today we are taking a look at Total War Warhammer, the latest game in the Total War franchise, published by Sega, this time themed around the Games Workshop game Warhammer Fantasy, not to be confused with their other, their futuristic one, Warhammer 40k, which is the one I'm more familiar with, I am moderately familiar with Warhammer Fantasy, a few of my friends did play that when we were kids, and I played uh, Warhammer Quest, so I, I am familiar with the world. Anyway, if you're not familiar with the Total War games, they are kind of like grand strategy, huge epic scale, real time battle, well I guess semi real time, if you're playing another person it's real time, but if you're playing the AI you can pause whenever the hell you like. You've got the overworld map, your goal is generally just to conquer, pillage, loot, control the world. There's a little bit of a story, and I've been playing it for, wow, 12 hours already, I honestly can't believe it's been 12 hours already. That's comprised of like a couple of live streams I did just to show people the game and then some off-camera play as well. I can show you a little bit about what's available in the base game but then we're going to jump into a campaign in progress so I don't have to just spend the majority of this video building up a force. I can actually go show off some fighting. So, in the base game you have the Empire of the Dwarves, the Greenskins which are Orcs, Vampire Counts and I don't know if I'm going to get this video up in time but if you pre-ordered the game or you buy the game within the first week of launch you get the Warriors of Chaos army for free. I think after that they don't just disappear, I think it's a case of they'll, they'll cost something. But there you go, so the Empire, they are, in fact I think the only army that's rated as easy to play is the Dwarves. Yeah, and the only one that's rated as hard is Warriors of Chaos, but that's because they're very, very different to how they play. They don't have settlements, they just roam, and their their warband counts as like their, their base of operations. It's very interesting. Would have liked if I could theme them more around Nurgle, but we're not getting into that because they might not be available by the time you see this. So we'll focus on the four that are just in the base game. There is some notable absences. There's no elves. There's no lizard men. There's no dark elves. Well, it's, hang on. In Warhammer Fantasy, it's dark elves and high elves, right? I'm getting confused with elder and dark elder. Anyway, there is some notable absences, and that does strongly hint at them coming further down the line via DLC. You're going to have to keep that in mind. Within each army, though, if you... Take a look at, say, let's look at the dwarves. It tells you how they work. It tells you generally how their playstyle is. It tells you what their top units are, so you can go looking for what is your preference. I'll go into more about the stats once we're actually in a game. And if you do pick an army, you then get the choice of a couple of characters currently. I don't know if they plan to add any more heroes later on. They start with different units. You can also adjust the difficulty here. They start with different faction effects. And also, one in particular is the faction leader. See, he doesn't have that. So even if you were to play as, say, Ungrim Iron Fist, during diplomacy and whatnot, you're still technically this guy, it's just you don't have active control of him until you do certain things. You can also enable introduction, which is essentially the tutorial. You get an introductory battle where it talks you through the commands and tells you the basics of play via the uh, the narrator. So then you have the Greenskins, they're the Horde army. Vampire Counts, they're a bit interesting in the sense that they can only capture certain types of settlements. They can't capture dwarf settlements, they can only raise them to the ground or pillage them. They have to capture human ones because the idea here is you're converting them to vampires and zombies and whatnot. They also don't have any ranged units, which I didn't realise when I first... This is the army I first tried during my kind of showing the game off livestream. It was a little bit weird having no ranged units. But I like that they're trying to change up the different ways to play compared to, well, most recently Total War Rome 2 or whatever it was. I didn't play that one. I played Shogun 2 a lot though, so any comparisons I'm making to previous Total War games, it's to Shogun 2. That's the only one I put any kind of great deal of time into. But anyway, yes, we'll go into a ca uh, campaign in progress. And we're going to go into the Emperor save. Playing as the humans. This is my first time playing as the humans. So far, and I'm actually playing as the gentleman you see in that picture there. He's not the Emperor himself, he's one of the Lords under the Emperor. Decided that I liked the sound of his stuff better. And if I remember correctly, I think I just finished taking over the entirety of the starting territory from some rival humans. And now I'm kind of free to branch out. But we'll start with the overview stuff, the over map stuff, sorry. We'll go into a little bit about what the stats for units are, how heroes operate in this one compared to Shogun 2 and other Total War games. We'll get into at least one battle, maybe two, and we'll talk a little bit about the game as we play. If you want to see me just playing the game at length, there is a couple of long VODs on the channel that you can go find in the, the live stream playlist. Also the initial load is very long. It might be extra long because I'm also currently rendering with OBS, but we'll see. I'm enjoying the game so far, I really, really like Shogun 2. I wouldn't say I'm very good at it, but I really like it. I think my problem with all the Total War games is... When I capture a settlement, I always like to have a moderately sized army to defend it because I hate having to recapture it later. But that doesn't really work because of the army upkeep. 
The more units you have, the more they cost to maintain, the less money you're making, and you stifle your own growth by having to, or if you try to stretch your armies too thin. And that's a mistake I very frequently make. So hopefully this game will be the first one where I actually kind of avoid that trapping, although I must admit, I over, in the Vampire Count game, I did fall into that, and I kind of screwed myself over. But the Humans one's going well so far. I think I have four settlements. And if you capture every settlement or area that can be a settlement within a section of the map, you get to do a commandment that applies to the whole area. This can be stuff like more tax, uh, more replenishment rate if you lose people in battle. Okay, good, I can stop filling time, right? Let me remind myself, because I've been playing in a Chaos game, so... As far as... you can activate kind of like a story mode. Or it kind of activates itself, and my current story mode objective is to come over here and have a fight in the underground. Now, if I remember correctly, I did test this to see how big a force was waiting for me, because it varies from army to army. It's a very, very big army down there. So, the army I have sitting here... There we are. Despite now having many, many veteran units, it isn't quite strong enough. So, what we could probably do is build this guy up to a full 20 out of 20 army, and then try and take him on with that. But yeah, so we have this down here. This is my capital. And then I came down here and took this place, which is currently undefended. And then also I have my main army, my main aggressive army, which is currently in Helmgart. And then I also took Ilhart. So yeah, this whole region is mine. It is time. And this is 17 out of 20. Yeah, so this is my army leader. He's level 9. He started with a, a mortar, which I love. But let's take a little look at the... Well, to finish talking about the overworld map, there's some dwarf settlements over here. There's another human army over here, which I believe I'm currently allied with. Or maybe not allied, but kind of like a ceasefire. And over here there's more humans. Now I think... No, they're neutral. They're neutral. There is an army over here somewhere that turned aggressive on me for no reason. I think it might be these guys? Hmm. Either way. I'm having to watch this side of my land because someone over there is aggressive to me. And I'm pretty sure that's the only army that's currently aggressive. We can actually go to the diplomacy tab down here and double check. With oh no, I must have made peace with them. Diplomacy, my lord. Yes, thank you, Chitori Man. So he's the kind of narrator. He turns up regardless of which army you play. He he seems to be an omnipotent soothsayer, I guess, who talks to birds. Like, even if I was playing as the Vampire Count guy, which is this guy down here, he comes to them. Even if he plays the orcs, you still get the old blind man with the crow. It's all linking together as part of the story. This doesn't cover end times, as far as I'm aware. It also doesn't cover the newer, kind of, rejigged Warhammer Fantasy, which is Age of Sigmar. It is just true old-fashioned Warhammer fantasy before the end time stuff. So anyway, yes, as it turns out, I must have made peace with them before I finished playing this. I currently have trade relations with all the humans around me, though, which means I can't really conquer them. So it does kind of leave the, the dwarves there, and also the army have to fight for the story. So to go back to the overall map, that's my current money, which is not a lot, because I've been spending it on buying upgraded troops. And that's how much I'm getting per turn, and there's my army upkeep there. My hero over here. There's going to be a lot of explaining stuff, by the way. If you're already familiar with how Total War games work, there's not much here that's different, at least from Shogun 2. So you might find this a little bit dull, but chances are you've already decided whether or not you want the game. This is more so for people who might not be entirely familiar with how these games work. So this is my hero, and you do find loot in this game, and loot can be stolen if you lose battles. I'm wearing the Gambler's Armor, which is giving me a ward save, 10% chance, and a 5 plus armor. Also got a Luxon, which is giving me physical resistance, and you also do have, well, these were called retainers in Shogun 2, so that's the closest facsimile that I can think of. They're, they're people who accompany your character. You don't actually see them, but they give you bonuses. So I have a messenger, which is giving me more movement range on the campaign map, and also public order, which is just kind of to stop riots and, well, vampiric and chaos corruption are two things in the game that can happen to your settlements. And he also has a trait... And if we go to our skill tree, skill trees vary depending on the type of hero. Like, for example, this is a mage-focused guy, so he does have a spell line. He does also have some traits, but if you pick a, a, a physically-based character, they'll probably just have, like, a bunch of, here's more armor, here's more attack. And you can build some rather powerful melee-based characters. They, they can be tanky as hell. There's a clip available on my YouTube channel. I called 1 versus 500, and it was a vampiric count I made that I just, I pumped everything into making him strong rather than the army he leads. And it came down to him just being the sole survivor. My army got wiped out by an opposing force. And he managed to fight off about 500 guys by himself. He just broke their morale, made them run, disintegrated them. 
It was stupid and amazing at the same time, and I don't think that was anything ever possible in Shogun 2. I don't know about the other Total War games, but in Shogun 2, your, your daimyo was generally very squishy. They were there just to do buffs and also to provide morale. And anyway, we also have a tech tree. Tech trees very wildly, depending on which race you're playing as in this game. For the humans, it's based on which buildings you have built, giving you access to various upgrades if you've built, say, I built the rally field, so I got all these. I can't train anything else until I build one more of these buildings. For Chaos, I think it's based on how much you pillage. Uh, for Dwarves, it's, well, for uh, the Vampire Counts, it's depending on which books you choose to study, like the Book of Death or the Book of, of Magic. And the, you have Dwarves ones were actually based around cash because they're Dwarves. So yeah, there's a lot of variance there. Anyway, this army is pretty strong. But I'd ra I'm not sure which army I want to use. I could actually use both together and potentially just do this now. We'll let a turn tick by though just to show you what happens when a turn ends. We might get some diplomacy to deal with. So when we do that, all the AI have their turns. You can choose to, as it says up, it says up here, you can choose to like turn off all their... Oh, we got an event. You can turn off all their movement to speed up turns and things like that or slow it down if you want to see every move they're making. So they say you revel in victory. They say you spend more times erecting time, erecting monuments to battles past than managing the realm. They say you are a fool. So I can either pick, we'll see who is a fool, which gives me war fever, or fervor, sorry. So for three turns, all my forces get plus six leadership, or I could be humble, which reduces recruitment cost. We are about to recruit a few things for this army over here, so them being 25% cheaper for three turns is the one I'm going to go for. Now keep in mind that doesn't affect their upkeep, so it's still going to make them cost stuff to exist. Now let's see, what could this army use more of? Got three swordsmen. I'll go over specific like, unit traits and stuff in a second. Three spearmen, four bows, and four mounted cavalry, who are also missile cavalry. But we could round that off with a fourth one of them, I suppose. Yes, a sound plan. And let's go for a bog standard spearman. Alright. So that'll put him up to 18 out of 20. That might be enough. We'll see. Alright, so anyway, to quickly go over a, a standard unit, let's pick this swordsman. The little arrows here just mean he is ranked up. I've actually bought a building which means they start ranked up. Which gives them slightly bigger stats. You, if you see the, the green bars here, the green parts of the bars, they are the parts they are getting increased as a result of being seasoned veterans. Anyway, any traits the unit have is up here. These are shielded, which means shields have a chance of blocking arrows, bolts, rifle shots and similar. But only if they are facing the thing that is firing at them, which is important. Facing in battle is exceptionally important in this game. Compare that to say like the spearmen. They are shielded again, which means they have a chance to block arrows. They're anti-large, which means they do better against large monsters. I like that it says it has to be something that's at least as large as a horse. There is bigger than that though. There's giants, there's trolls, there's weird bat monsters. And they also have a charge defense bonus against large foes. Generally when something large hits into a unit in this game, you will see half the unit that's been rammed go flying through the air. But these guys have a trait where they can, they can bear the brunt of the blow to a certain extent. Uh, I think that's about it in terms of TV7 thing. These are, yeah, we, these are weak against armor. Their guns aren't very good against armor. Not armor piercing. But they are very fast, which is exceptionally annoying in this game. Very fast units are so frustrating because you, you can't catch them. And Vanguard deployment means they don't have to deploy in your deployment zone when you start a fight. That, that's basically it. So, because I'm not at war any, with anybody right now, I think bringing my other army over here and both of us attacking in conjunction is probably my safest bet to make sure I don't lose. So we'll slowly make my army come over here. By the time he gets over here, they'll be made and we'll be ready to assault this story bit here. We'll let the turn past. Pass, not past. Oh, what's this? What do you want? Your strength rank is 39. That's very strong compared to me. They want a non-aggression pact. You seem like a good team to have on my side, considering you're on my borders. Buttering people up, you know, playing the diplomacy game. It works better in Total War games than civilization games where the AI will just turn on you for no reason. That can happen here as well but it's less likely if you've been having good relations with someone. That is until you reach a point in Shogun 2 called Realm Divide. Now I haven't got in furthest, far enough rather in a game of Total War Warhammer yet to know if there's an equivalency of Realm Divide. In Shogun 2 that meant the Shogunate became paranoid that you were about to take over because you were too powerful so everybody turns on you. Every civilization left on the map will turn on you. It kind of forces you to have to hurry to try and become the Shogun otherwise you die. I hated that mechanic. I think a lot of people hated that mechanic and hopefully it no longer exists. Now 
you are ready to attack. As are you. We'll wait one more turn just so I have an auto save. Just in case anything goes horribly wrong. Actually, you know what? A good idea. Oh, right. Hang on. Let me handle this. See, you'll notice this is this is the Emperor Karl Franz talking, even though I'm not playing as him. They want an unaggressive pact as well, and they're going to give me 300 gold to agree to it. I'll take your money. I have bigger fish fish to fry right now. Yeah. So what we're going to do is we're going to do a save, and the reason we're going to do a save is I think I want to kind of show off a a thing that has existed since Shogun and exists in this, and I don't like it. It's how the computer chooses to auto-resolve fights if you pick to auto-resolve. Alright, this should be close enough that I get allied help. Let's have a little look at this. Oh, it's not underground. I thought it was an underground fight. Okay, so when your opposing forces meet an enemy, you're given this screen and you get to see what the enemy has. Now, I've just realised my other team is not being classed as an ally. I thought they were close enough. So I am going to load my save and bring him a bit closer. But we can see here the enemy's got two armies. And rather frighteningly, they've also got Hellstorm rocket batteries, as well as a couple of mortars, which are, as I say, are very, very fun. So when you assault an enemy, you get this bar down here, balance of power. It, it shows you your chance to win based on pure numbers. Obviously, how you play tactically matters. I don't like this because very often you can't auto-resolve this fight. Why can't I do this? Oh, because it's a quest battle, I see. Usually you can choose to auto-resolve, and if there's any, if it's 50%, and 50% or say 60-40 in your favour or 70-30 in your favour, the AI will always make you do worse than if you just played it yourself. And I kind of wish it didn't do that. Because sometimes if you're trying to do a grand battle across a whole region, you don't want to fight every single fight because it will make you forget what you were doing. But you kind of have to if you don't want to suffer more losses than you deserve to suffer. There's also situations like say a city is being sieged and all you have is the retainers in the city to defend it. If an army of sizable force attacks you, they'll wipe out your garrisoned troops and not lose a single person if you let it auto-resolve. They're always going to win, but in those situations you, you definitely have to play the fight because you will definitely kill at least one person. And I hate that. It's, it's been like that since, since Shogun 2. I assume it was like that in Rome 2 or whatever. It, it, there's not, it's not quite right. It's never been quite right and they still haven't got it right here either. But anyway... So I do have to fight this fight. I really hate that my ally isn't close enough for me, even though I thought I moved him so he was. So we're going to load up the save, and I'm going to move him a little bit more. It is possible that this is just a one army only fight. But as far as I'm aware, that's not a thing. Yeah, so we'll move you, like, not close enough that it's a sword. Right, he is definitely close enough. So if this doesn't work, it just means you have to use one army. Right, you have to use one army. So, yeah, I do have the choice of doing auto resolve. Oh, wait, no, sorry. Normally I would, but I don't here. We have to fight this fight. Fair enough. So, what's my strategy going to be? I'm going to put my horses hopefully in some forest. Oh, that's a very interesting little lineup we've got here. I've got nothing but forest. All right, they're going to hide in the forest, come around the side, and take out the mortars, or at the very least, force them to move so that they don't pelt my troops. He's only got one other range thing to, uh, other than that, and I've got a lot. So we should be okay, but I've got to keep in mind he has got the other army that will be coming in from some direction. Anyway, yeah, we'll do the Battle of Blood Pine Wound, Woods, rather, and I'll try and survive. And then we'll get into the grit of it. The meat of it, rather. The grit of the meat? Who knows? The battle system. And this is the fun stuff. The, the, the huge scale of it involved. It does actually accurately, accurately represent the Warhammer Fantasy game, which, compared to 40k, was more about big units. Well, it sounds like we're going to get an epic speech as well. I'll shut up and let him talk. No speech! The speeches in Shogun 2 were so good. Alright, so... Th wow. They're just not giving us... Actually, you know what? They've, they've done this so that you have something in your favour. Mortars and stuff need to be well back so that they can see their targets fire, not get harassed. They've started them right in front of us so that we can easily just start brawling straight away. So, I'm not seeing any arrow dictating where their allies are going to charge from though, which is a bit annoying. But anyway, they aren't necessarily going to deploy like you see them by the way. They get a chance to change I think, or normally they would, but this is a story battle so all bets are off. Anyway, 
First of all, we're going to take my mortar and we're going to put it back up here on the hill. It's going to be concealed. And we can see his line of sight there. That cone shape, he can see all of them. Unless they deploy all the way over here, of course. So that's probably fine. Uh, we're going to put my... Where are my horses going to go? My, my mounted cavalry with guns. Let's assume they are deploying like I see them. Oh, no, no, no. Get, get there and get hidden. There, they are concealed. Yeah, if you see the branch thing when you're concealing them, that means they are hidden. They'll only get revealed if an enemy troop walks very, very close or if you shoot or charge out at them. Alright. I'm just debating where to put my great sword as well. I think I'll charge them in from the side. So we'll put them just hidden there by themselves. You can make groups, by the way, and I'm going to do that in a second. Like, for example, I could just do that and say, Hey, all my archer guys, you're group 2. And if I press group 2, that's all them selected. I'm going to put them on skirmish mode, so that means they'll run away if something approaches them. They are so close. Can they actually just shoot them from where they're standing? Yeah, they totally can. Hmm. Well, what I'll probably do actually is select all of these guys, and we'll tell them to go into formation where the archers are at the back. Normally you'd want to do archers at the front, but because we're starting right smack dab in front of the enemy army, I don't think that's a good idea. Yeah, we'll pretty much just do that. And then we'll tell them that they are squad two, just so I have them separate, as the case may be. Why does it put them in front? Did I select the wrong option? I think I did. Oh, yeah, I did. Melee front. There we go. Okay. Why is it not putting them behind? Ah, screw it. I'll just do it automatically. Or rather, I'll do it myself. There. Archers behind. They can see the whole army. My army is just going to charge. My leader provides buffs. He's also got two spells. He can rain down shards of searing doom. He can also summon ghost wolves. Sorry, golden ghost wolves. Let's be exact here. I'll put my leader there just so he's giving everybody a buff. I hate all the trees being in my way, but I think we're good to go here. We'll pause as soon as it starts just so I can get a little look. But yeah, let's select start. Now, what we're not going to see here... Oh yeah, they did start just where it said. Oh, I see. It's set up so I'm getting an ambush. That's why we started so close. And they're just moving without ignoring me. Eh, yeah, without seeing me, rather. Yeah, it didn't let me go over Winds of Magic. You'll be very familiar with this if you did play Warhammer Fantasy. It's how much magic points you get and usually at the start of a fight you get the chance to gamble and try and get a higher amount but it could also be lower. That affects how many spells you can cast because there's a limited supply. Alright so we are just kind of like we're we're here and we're charging eh? Okay. Kind of wish I'd paid more attention to that because then I would have charged my great swords down pretty much instantly. We're going to charge them down they're going to charge them down. They are going to wet themselves when they see this. My gun cavalry. They're pretty much just going to like kind of rock up there. Let's unpause. Normally you'd want to be pausing quite a lot. You can also speed up time if you prefer. Yep, they, they did not expect that. Now, where is my leader so I can start casting some badass spells? So this is new compared to Shogun anyway. There's the Golden Hound. Look at that. Also, we just instantly got victories in our grasp. I think my Alpha Strike was a bit too strong. Alright, gun guys. Do your work. There they go. Shoot them in the back. Don't let them do any of their mortar crap. And here come my greatsword guys. Let's cast uh, some Searing Doom on there. Because they're stuck in combat so they can't avoid them. And in fights like this, where it does give you a big advantage, keep in mind this is early in the story mode. It's more like, I, I like this more because I get to just watch the fights. And it's really, really fun just looking at all the animations play out as units smack into each other. Oh. Quite a few of the enemy units have broken. There's my mortar firing in. Alright, now greatsword guys are going to just tire themselves out if they chase them. So go flank them. Flanking matters. If you hover over a unit, you can see what's like positively affecting them, what's negatively affecting them. Units get tired as well, so in long fights, it's a good idea to probably... I love that they just stopped and instantly started shooting them. Horses, deal with them. Yeah, it's a good idea in massive, very long battles or sieges to kind of just give your people a rest. 
let them stop being winded. Yeah, they're they're not having a good time. I thought they had an allied enemy force. It hasn't even given me any arrows saying, hey, there's another enemy unit coming from this direction. Oh, that poor sod. Look at, look at the guy hitting you with the big sword. He's right behind you. No, 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 that's... You deserve that. Where's my leader? I want him in here to help these guys. Also, you know what? Just just summon some more golden dogs on them as well, because why not? My hidden units got revealed, eh? Or did their hidden units get revealed? No. Oh, hey, there comes enemy reinforcements. Okay, now, hang on. We'll just pause for a second here. So, their enemy units are coming in from that direction. It's nothing I can't handle, but it's a good idea for me to get up onto this hill because then I can get a charge bonus by running down the hill at the enemy. Now, they are truly broken, right? They're not going to recover. So I'm just thinking I'll keep my unit up here and get ready. Right, I have to watch, though, to make sure they don't turn around and instantly start shooting at them because they can get their morale back and stop being broken. All right, let's see. Our guys, let's put you up. Oh, I didn't realize that was counting like that. Let's put you there. I need to make sure the rest of the units are done. Mortar! Do I have time to move the mortar very far? Probably not, but we can move you like there and be safe. All right, they're all running off, so let's get up onto this hill ASAP, rather. Let's put you more like there-ish. Leader, don't go running off on your own. Get up here. Oh, I didn't realize there was still a unit here if it's not quite dead. Oh, it's his leader. That's why he's surviving. Oi, my leader. Get over here and have a fight with his leader. No wonder he's actually winning. Ah, they have gun horses as well. Also, yeah, look at that. They recovered on the line. I hate when that happens. It's very annoying. We'll still have this, though, just based on numbers. Although, they, no, actually, they did have more. Is their leader dead yet? My leader kicking his ass? Yeah, I know my lord's under attack. He's, he's okay for a mage in terms of how tanky he is. He's shaking damage sustained. Alright, the important stuff is up here, though. Charge down the hill at them. Charge down the hill at them. Look how far my horses have had to run. There's a good example of that, actually. The, the orcs have goblin, uh, goblin wolf riders who are goblin archers who ride the back of wolves. Don't question it, it makes perfect sense. And the problem with them are they are so quick compared to almost every unit. I had a situation where I did have ranged units, but I didn't have any cavalry, and although I'd won the fight, it just would not proc the end of the battle because the bastards would constantly run away. And I, it was just, I had to give them the runaround until they were totally out of stamina, and there was no need for it. Is their leader dead? Oh, their leader is dead. Attack them. That's where the that's the final big brawl up there. That's the last one that's happening here. Can I summon any more dogs? There's still a lot of magic left. Yeah, there is. Summon summon some dogs there. You know what? Also, just drop some spears on them as well. Why not? I've, I've accidentally been storing a crap ton of magic. Oh, I think I over the first spell. Yeah, we'll let that cast. Oh, one of my one of my gun horses fleet. Where's this? What made you flee? Well, either way, they've survived. A fleeing unit will live. Uh, and they're now off the map as well. I can see the golden dogs from here. Yeah, decisive victory. Oh, their leader's still alive. Oh, wait, no, this is the leader of the, the allies. Yeah, what a bunch of flankers. Get over here. I want to see my leader punch their leader. Oh yeah, yeah, this is a different special guy. The other guy died. My leader's trying to push through the enemy to get to them. 
The enemy's running, so he has a lot of time. Golden dogs, get him. Come on, cast quickly enough. Oh, I should have led it a bit more. Oh no, that was perfect, in fact. Golden dogs of death. Alright, everybody, get that guy. I don't even if the battle ends at this point, I'm not leaving until he's dead. Yeah, but I want him to die. Catch him. Catch him. He's running towards the archers. Archers, catch him. No, archers. Just like smack him. Yeah. Oh, he's tripped. He's tripped. Oh, the army just ran over him. He's up. I think. I think he's up. Yeah, there he is, right there. He's got 1,200 HP left. He's trying to push through the whole army. He's not going to make it. 900 HP. Apparently, there's still an enemy unit over here somewhere. It's alive. Oh, they're running off the map. I see. Well, if you're finished doing that, go shoot him. Is he dead yet? No, he's not dead yet. I saw his flag. Oh, his flag is... Oh, yeah, there he is. He's got... 453 HP left. He ain't walking away from this. I want to watch him die. He's trying to walk away from this. That's him right there. Come on, destroy him. Smush his face. Sadly, I think if I summoned Golden Dogs right now, all I'd be really doing is hurting my own units. 2 HP. He has 2 HP. There he goes. He did a backflip. I also just got an achievement for doing that, but I assume it's story related to the humans because I've not done very much as the humans yet. So I managed to lose 200, which is a little high, but they lost like a thousand. So when you win a battle, you get a choice of what to do. We could pardon the captives, which earns us money. But we also lose replenishment rate of the people we've lost. We could also just execute the captives, which increases our leadership. Oh yeah, look at that. Part of each unit actually did live. Oh wait, no. Their, their hero lived on 1 HP. Or we can take on captives, which increases unit replenishment by 12%, which is massive. And we're going to do that. So, we did the story quest, which gives us a Sword of Striking, which is a charge bonus plus sword. And also we recruited another hero, which is a Battle Wizard, who looks like Ming the Merciless. And those survivors ran off somewhere. So let me just see. Let's have a look at your skill tree. Yeah, so he has an entirely different skill tree to my hero. Different spells, the Wind Blast, Curse of Midnight. Ooh, urns. Uranon's Thunderbolt. That sounds like my kind of thing. Evasion. Oh, to make him easier to get away from stuff. So he has an effect on the campaign map, which means if an enemy hero, that's equivalent of, like, say, a ninja or something from Shogun, tries to assassinate one of your characters, it's just got a base 5% chance. Which is a negative, actually. I just realised. Oh, yeah, because you've got the easily trapped trait. Damn it. Yeah, sometimes they can roll bad traits, sometimes they get good traits. That's probably not befitting of a... A mage, actually, so you don't get that sword. One of these armies would be a better choice. You've already got a good sword. I don't believe you have any kind of special sword. No, you do not. There you go. You do have the Seed of Rebirth, which gives you a passive ability, which just restores the HP of people around. Uh, yes, yeah, so we have this special guy. And we can just send him to harass places, or we can make him join an army to actually join in the fight. I'm going to make him join... I already have a mage there, so I guess by default you join you join that army. Which will have to be next turn. Alright, my main army is going to come round to here. As best he is able. They are going to return to the capital. As best they are able. So we also can build some buildings here because we've got some funds for winning that fight. Ideally I'm looking for something which will increase my cash flow. That is a... Oh, it goes from 60 income to 80. That is not good enough. What about increasing pottery here? 150 to 200, plus we get some more uh, kiln stuff to trade. I could upgrade to this, which lets me make great swords, hand gunners, and empire captains. But as I say, money is a little bit tight right now. 200 to 400. 
and it unlocks more tech. That's what we're doing. We're upgrading for almost all of our money my port. We'll make a turn skip by here. I, I probably won't do another fight in the video because we're already getting a little bit longer. As I say, there's two massive VODs, or one massive VOD and then one clip. You can watch if you want to see me. Oh, a faction got wiped off the map. Some war got declared. Mr. Mage Man, join this army for now. So he counts as a unit, they're together now, and they are going to sit in my capital. So I forgot to go over the asking price for Total War Warhammer is £39.99. pence. That is quite steep for a PC game, but it is one of those games, if it's your bag, you'll put hours and hours and hours and hours and hours into it. There is a multiplayer mode, you can co-op or be adversarial. I don't like that you're so close to that town, what are you doing? Hmm... I might have to actually move my other army over that direction then. You have to kind of guess where your next stab in the back is going to come from. But anyway, as I was saying, yeah. I was checking out some Steam reviews as well. It's sitting at about a 75% positive rating right now. And most of the negatives are... There, there were some launch issues for some people in certain cards, it seems. So that may not be an accurate representation of how the fan base feels about the game. I like it. I like it as much as Shogun... Maybe a little bit more because it's it's Warhammer, but well, I really did like the Japanese setting of Shogun, though. It's good, is what I'm saying. It'll be down to the diehard Total War fans to decide for themselves whether or not this stacks up to some of the, the greater games in the series. But you couldn't really go that wrong with this. Is there going to be DLC down the line? Well, of course there is, because that's what they do. The Shogun 2 had tons of DLC. I wouldn't be surprised if down the line there's going to be a Lizardman DLC or an Elf, you know, that kind of stuff. And... It does feel like that kind of stuff is held back. Having only technically four races at launch, it does feel small compared to the greater Warhammer world. But you've got a massive map. There's a storyline that plays out regardless of who you're playing as. Chaos kind of corruption starts from the north and starts fairing down and you've got to try and stop them. If you've liked what you've seen here, go check out the link in the description box below. It'll take you to the Steam page. Read, out, uh, read up rather on some reviews to decide for yourself whether this is something you want. It is a steep asking price, rather. There is some stuff I wish that they'd kind of tweaked a little bit, the auto-resolve, the, the upkeep system. But I also appreciate that some of the armies in this play vastly different, whereas in Shogun 2 at least, you had different strengths in terms of the units, but you also always had kind of like the same units, more or less. They weren't, there wasn't enough diversity between the places you could start in, I feel. At least compared to the, the vastly different playstyles on offer here. Anyway, this has been a look at Total War Warhammer. If you enjoyed the video or just want to show your support to me or our developers, please do leave a like and subscribe if you want to see more. Thanks for listening and ta-ta for now.